we're here with David Higgs. Hello. Um, we've just spent the day on Ashdown Forest. Um, Doing a lot of walking, a lot of chatting, and not much taking pictures, but that was fine, wasn't it? That's fine. <laughs> Nothing wrong with taking a few pictures and, and seeing the world. That's uh, right. And, and we also looked at the exhibition, The Wheeled. Yes. The final day. That's right. Uh, if you want to go and see it, it's too late. Yeah. <laughs> we, we will have some pictures on the website that you can look at, but right now we're spending uh, the next half an hour or so going through some of, well, some of your favourites and my favourites. Yeah. Think. Would that be correct? I think so. I hope so, yes. Yeah. Um, so, if, you, if you're if you not familiar with David's work, um, it's, I think it's fine to say you've been photographing for quite a long time. Yes. Various different sort of genres, I guess, so over time. And uh, and I came across your work, I scanned some of your 617s. You did. Um, a few black and whites a while ago. Yes, a, well, quite a while. Yes, about five years ago, I think, actually. Yeah. And, yeah. and since then, you've started processing prints as platinum palladium. That's right. I moved to sort of platinums, yes, about, about four years ago. I started doing sort of alternate processes and um, dipping my feet into platinum before sort of going full bore the last of three years, really. Yeah. And I, w I was asking earlier how you get into it because you've been a film photographer. Yes. Um, and mix of black and white and colour. Yes. Mostly silver prints, enlarged or in. That's work. right. And then making my own ink jets over the years as well as technology's improved. Yeah. And I think I struggled to get the look that I wanted um, from ink jets compared to images of, you know, platinum images that I'd seen. Um, mainly sort of historical images, you know, in museums or... Just like the Victorian Albert Museum. Yeah, v &A is a good source of, of, you know, those sort of old techniques. And I was trying to get that sort of, not necessarily deliberately retro look, but definitely that tonal look where life isn't black or white, as it can be with a silver print. Um, there's much more control of the, especially the lower end of the tones. It's very gracefully dips into black or as, you know, an acceptable black yeah. with, that you get with platinum printing. A dark, a dark grey, a very dark grey. Yes. Yeah. Um, where, where were you getting your photographic references from for this? Cause, cause who would be the, the, the photographers you were looking at when you were thinking about platinum plating? Was it, was it just the historical I th photographs? I Margaret think so. Margaret Cameron's? And yes, the, yeah, definitely. Um, and I think also I'd seen a few books by Sally Mann, who obviously um, is mostly known for her wet plate collodion work, but she also had a couple of books where they were the platinum prints were made from the, the wet plate collodion negatives. And um, they've got some just beautiful um, warm brown tones that I, that I was trying to get. So before I did platinum, um, Platinum Palladium, but we're going to call it Platinum because yeah. that's what everyone does, isn't it? Um, before I got into that, I was doing Argyrotypes, which is kind of a brown cyanotype. And then um, I was toning them in selenium. And that was getting pretty near to platinum. And I think it's quite good to sort of cut your teeth on a relatively cheap chemical um, before then going into platinum. Because it, unfortunately, it's expensive and it's... Is very um, not random, but it's it's very unpredictable in sort of the contrast and tones that you get. So, a change in temperature, a change in humidity in your dark room can make a big difference. And I presume you were talking about the acidity of the paper, so acidity of water or alkali, or water. Or All of those things have have an effect, and as much as you can sort of try and sort of counter those or accommodate those changes. Um, Happy accidents can occur. You'd have to run lab-like conditions to try and get consistency. Would that be not be right? I think even then it's pretty unpredictable. Right. So, yeah. uh, <laughs> so, so to get one print, you, you, it's not like an inkjet press book, and you get the platinum plate in. Presumably, you end up doing four or five test prints, getting things right, yes. learning about it, and and have, give, give us an idea of uh, an eight by ten platinum plate in print, roughly, cost wise. Cost wise, well, it depends. <laughs> <laughs> it depends on the paper you use and um, I guess it depends on how many times you need to make that particular print yeah. I mean there's one print in the gallery that I had to print 20 times to get something I was happy to put up but that is the exception you know some of them are, are right first time yeah. 
but highlight areas are difficult um, because sometimes there's vagaries in the paper so you get a change in contrast we get some specs and things so um, it, it can be a, a cruel mistress to, to, to get a, a, a you know an acceptable print um, but you know sometimes you it doesn't go as you expect but then you get a different look and you think oh actually that's wrong quite that. like that yeah. yeah let's let's try and get that again and uh, yeah, so it, it, there is an, an element of unpredictability and there's an element of control over it. But yeah, And the other aspect that comes in from your work is the use of, um, I mean, you use a few normal-ish lenses, yes. Tessars, yeah. Xenars, yeah. Um, and you're using a large format camera, so you're shooting yes. 5.4. It's all on 5.4, yes. Um, but you're using mostly older lenses yes. that don't have shutters. Yes. <laughs> so barrel, barrel lenses. That's right. Uh, and then the most common one people may have heard of are Petsfam. That's lenses, right. Yes. Which are old projection lenses. Yeah, old projection some. lenses or old actual, you know, camera lenses as well. Yeah. Um, they have a very unique sort of a lens signature and um, there's often quite a lot of curvature to the focal field. So, you know, they're characteristically sharp in the centre and then blurry and swirly to the edges and wanders in and out of focus yes in interesting ways and you know this my main subject matter is woodland which is a very chaotic um you know subject matter and can be difficult you know you walk through a wood and it's a your eyes are taking everything in and it's a very beautiful environment and then as soon as you commit that to film or to pixels you kind of flatten everything and you tend to lose that depth of field and you lose that perception that you have um, and you, when you're in a woodland, your own eyes, um, your pupil enlarges, so your you know natural aperture increases, so you've got less depth of field. Um, and it's just a way of trying to capture that sort of feeling um, in a in an image, yeah. which is which is challenging. Yeah. Um, and to, you know, nature isn't always as accommodating with compositions as you'd like. Um, and it's a way of being able to distill elements of the woodlands into something that gives you a sort of a feeling or an emotion yeah. that is sometimes difficult, you know, if it's just a flat image. Now, when these lenses that are, I think say they, they were mostly Victorian or early 20th century. Yeah, it's mainly used, used for portraiture. Uses use Zeiss Jenna Tessar, which is a lens I, I love because and I saw it first in, in some of your pictures. Yes. Which which has a, this they call it swirly character, I think that's pretty, They do. That's the term for it. But it has a, a, um, a ranging, we'll, we'll come to and we'll talk about those in a second. But we, we, if we start on one, the first picture. Yes. Um, so this is actually taken with a conventional lens. This is a Xenar. It's a Xenar. So it's, it's, it's just what, it's what, you know, the inverted commas junk lens that comes with the camera. And this is actually taken on a, on a, on a Linhof. And um, this particular tree... Um, is, is you know it's kind of my favorite tree <laughs> I don't know if everyone has a favorite tree but I certainly got one and it's um, you know it changes over the years and bits fall off it and bits grow and um, I was just waiting for the right atmospheric conditions for this which is you know a dense fog really um, and it's got a bit of back tilt on it so the, the plane of focus goes through the upper branches where they're sort of just starting to cross it's and then leaning meets, into the picture yeah and then meets the, meets the trunk now this the exhibition is called Weald. Yes. Um, so Weald is um, is an Anglo-Saxon term for sort of impenetrable woodland. And um, I live in the southeast of England where the Weald is. Um, and it's often perceived as a sort of heavily urbanised part of the UK. I mean, it is the most densely populated part of the UK. Um, but Weald comes from a term from a forest that stretched from the south coast all the way up to where London is. Um, and the Romans had another name for it. They called it the Forest of Anderida. So, and they found it quite a challenge to get across because most of the land is clay, sandstone. Slightly boggy, as I said. Yes, found we found today. it was quite boggy today. You didn't take the right shoes with you, did no, you? No, never mind. I should have brought the Wellingtons, yes. Coming from the north, I thought you'd be well prepared for anything. I thought it was the south, I thought it was all paved. I don't know. <laughs> so, uh, yes, so we, got, so we had lots of mud and lots of clay today, um, which is amazingly, in a, in a month's time, will all be as hard as concrete, but it was very boggy today. But this is the wheel. Is Ashdown Forest part of the Weald? It's part of, yeah. No, Ashdown Forest is part of the Weald. So yeah. Ashdown Forest is a very large open access area, um, which is we don't have a lot of in the southeast. We've got the downs as well. Um, but for a wooded area, um, it's quite unique. 
and relatively unknown. I mean, people know yeah. Ashdown Forest through A.A. A. Milne and Piglets and, and all that. Poo Sticks. Poo Sticks Bridge, Sorry. yes. Yeah. Um, so and this is actually only taken about two miles from Poo Sticks Bridge, um, near Eeyore's gloomy place. Yeah. <laughs> Now you're saying you don't actually see many people because most people tend to congregate next to Poo Sticks Bridge. They go to Poo Sticks the Bridge. Or yes. the car, or the many car parks. So should... Yes, if you if you like uh, large format landscape photography, it's ideally suited because they uh, provided about 30 different car parks. So you're only really a miles walk from anywhere. Um, but what's unique is that um, people only tend to walk 100 metres and then go back to their car. So we didn't see, really see anyone today, did we? No, Which is incredible, time. really. Yeah. You know, it really felt quite wild in places. Very nice, yeah. This is a classic Ashdown Forest type of view where you've got Heathland and Scots Pine. And then in the distance, you've got part of the Downs. And right on the right... You can just see Friends Clump, which is planted in Victorian times. Is that the the the, the, the area? Yeah, just there, oh, right, which yeah. is quite quite a famous sort of bit yeah. of the forest because it kind of sticks out and there's a very good sort of vista from there. This is this is one of the things that I was quite surprised at because this looks like Loch Tulla. It looks like the sort of moorland of of uh, Western Scotland. Um, now I'm presuming it's because the Victorian sport brought back lots of Scots pines or whether, whether it was native trees at the time. But I noticed you're saying they, they, they've got some swing on this picture. You can see the right-hand side is in focus near to Yes. And the left-hand side. Well, that wasn't intentional, was it? No. It, um, Built-in camera. Built-in camera swing, yes. Bent camera. <laughs> not, not square? No. Well. But, but, but this is, this is <laughs> you were saying this is the characteristic, and there's, there's a few pictures of these sorts of trees there. Yes. And if you see it from a distance, these, these are the sort of views you're seeing. But as we walked into the forest, it, it changed characteristic. Yes, it's the, that, that's and that's that's. I mean, that's one of the things with landscape photography in Britain is there's such a variety of, of you know different different sort of types of areas. But Ashdown Forest, particularly, you know, you've got downland, heathlands, conifer plantation forest, um, as well as what would really be our ancient rainforest. You've got um, areas of ancient woodlands. That you know they're the same as they were two thousand years ago. So you've got this great variety in a relatively small space, easily accessed by car yeah. um, or bicycle. Um, and, and we and we found quite a few Victorian remains of, of grain mills. That's and, right. Um, it, and dams. It, and part things. of the industrial revolution happened here. The first blast furnaces in the UK were here, and that's because they had a readily source of wood. To, to fire them, um, limestone was pretty nearby, and we, you know, there's lots of evidence of iron ore, and um, most of the rivers do run blood red with um, iron ore in Ashdown Forest. Yeah, we'll, we'll have a couple of pictures on the website of, of, of an incredible red, yes, uh, river, unreal, yeah. almost sort of unnatural polluted colours. Yes, I think it would have would have made Batinsky quite happy. Yeah. Now this was this is one of the first pictures I saw of your. Um, this sort of character picture, mm. um, and this was taken with the Zeiss yes. lens from a Zeiss Myroflex camera, and you got yours for a, a remarkably small sum. Yes, and I had to buy the whole camera and pay rather more for it. But Six, they, sixty pounds for a very cloudy, chipped version, but it seems to work okay. But they have the the sense of movement. That's right throughout the picture here. Yeah. Uh, and this wasn't windy, was it? This is, no, this, no. The, all, all the movement in this picture is a characteristic of the lens. Yes. Uh, and I find that remarkable. It's, it's the sense of three-dimensionality it gives to the pictures. It does give it a three-dimensional quality. And also it gives, you as a photographer, you can concentrate on a part of the image and then let everything else sort of fall and meld into place. Um, taking, you know, this image taken with a large depth of field and a nicely corrected... You know, left and right, centre would it would look a bit dull, maybe. Yeah, and quite complex. Yes. Whereas you can distill it down to its, you know, sort of smaller components and simplify it to make it more understandable. And you know, there is a sense that the eye wanders around around the image. I'm lucky enough that this this is, you know, two minute walk away. Um, where I live is you know heavily wooded as well, and lots of ancient woodland. And this is actually an old droving road, so um, this is on. This would have been the old road to Hailsham, where the cattle market is. So they would have run the cattle down this road, and 
up until, I mean, I only found this out um, a few days ago, but up until 100 years ago, this was actually the road. Um, you know? Right. Cart. Cart. <laughs> cart. Yeah. Yeah. Now, you, you use a camera. These, these lenses that we're talking about don't come with shutters. No. Um, they are literally a set of lens elements. That's right. Possibly with an aperture, sometimes not. Yes, usually not, but um, yes. Um... And it's it's lens at its most basic form, really. And, and you use a four five camera. It's called a speed graphic. That's right. And I use that because it's got a focal plane shutter at the back. So I'm I'm using these lenses, you know, either without an aperture or wide open. Um, so you know, it's, if you're using you know wet plate collodion or some extremely slow film or ND filters, then you know, you could bring it down to a quarter or a second or or, lot, or longer. But I'm just using. I mean, all these were shot on the Alfred FP4, which is a fantastic film in 5.4. Um, so the, most most of the images are a thirtieth or a fiftieth of a second. Yeah, difficult to do with a hat in front of the lens. Very difficult to do with a hat. Yeah. Yes, but the nice thing about the speed graphic is you can put anything in front you were saying you put old torch lenses in front yeah, of it and so pinholes and all anything sorts. that looks like it could be a lens you can give it a go that's yeah. right so it does it does encourage experimentation so and they're not particularly expensive are they? no I no i mean there's a you can buy them from the uk uh, and they're a bit more expensive but there are you know hundreds of thousands in the states hanging around and they're pretty indestructible i mean they're quite flimsy cameras mm. they were the cheap press camera weren't they were they, the cheap the press cameras so people would wish we were photographing everything they're doing portraits reportage sports you know they'll come with sports finders and yeah it seems incredible you know i only ever shoot on a tripod after consideration but these guys were firing off but this be what Ouija was using. Exactly. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. The, the crime photography. If you don't know Ouija, do, do a Google for W E E G E E. He's got um, some fantastic pictures. And he, he was a he was a news reporter and a crime scene photographer yes. at one point, I think, wasn't he? Yeah. Um, fantastic of all handheld. Big fl big explosive flash torch. That's um, it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I move on to. This is another one that that surprised me. I think the. This almost looks like something like embroidery, or uh, mm. it, 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 it doesn't look quite William real. Morris or yes. something like that. Yeah. Yes. Um, and you were saying you quite often wander around with a camera on the tripod. I do. And holding it almost like a viewfinder. Just yes. Because the characteristic of the lens is just, it's, it's not what you see with a naked eye. No, it isn't. Um, Difficult to visualise what's going to happen. I guess after a few years you, you, you get more of a hang of it, but some things that may not on the surface appear so interesting or have a composition that you think would work or a, you know, actually looking through the ground glass you, you can see a different world sometimes. Um, and I do think it actually reproduces what we see but maybe with our eyes but maybe not what we see so much with our brain. Our brain's very clever at constructing what we're actually seeing because you know if you think of our eyes it's a simple, simple single meniscus lens. Um, and the centre of our vision is very sharp, but our periphery is is, is very blurry. But we scan when yeah. we're looking at things, and we put that together in our brain to make an image that makes sense to us. Whereas this is just distilling it down to kind of what we would see if we could, you know, really concentrate on what we're actually looking at. And you were saying that you photograph very often at dawn and dusk. Yes. Obviously not for um, golden hour light. No. But for a sense of. Um, I don't know, calm, I think, is that correct? I think so, it is a calm time of day. I mean, I have to say, almost all my images are taken at dawn. It's a convenient time for me to take photos as well, um, you know, with other commitments and family and things. It's, 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 it's a nice time of day when there's no one really else around and you've got the place to yourself. And, um, I don't know, you're waking up, the world's waking up, the birds are waking up, it's a nice nice place and nice time to be around yeah. and it's trying to capture there is a special quality to dawn light D different to, to a sunset i think know. when the light's low as well you, you were saying about that, the way the eye works the eye, yeah. the eye opens up and, exactly. and, and becomes a and when you go into woodland whatever time of day you, you know your eye has to do that and open up so you do lose that depth of field that brightness and it is all about sort of dappled light you know and your exhibition um how many did you, because there's quite a few prints. There's 51 prints. So, um, yes, and they're all in platinum, um, almost all exclusively from 5.4. There's a little bit of medium format in there as well. 
um, all um, 10 by 8s. That's quite a, a task, I imagine. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Did you know what you, saw, you were letting yourself in for? Was, it, was this something that was offered as an opportunity? It was. You? It was offered as an opportunity, um, and it was a five-month exhibition in, in, in a very nice um, it's location. A brilliant room. Um, you know, nicely lit and a uh, good sort of footfall and an opportunity to, for lots of people to see these images. So, uh, you know, on two floors. and Yes, and um, so... I'd been to that gallery before, and I, I think I forgot quite how big it was. <laughs> and then I realised, you know, oh, there's a bit of pressure on now to get all these prints done, because, you know, I, I didn't really want to print bigger than 10 by 8, because I think 10 by 8 in platinum is kind of the sweet spot, really. Um, and I also like the way that with a 10 by 8 and you're looking at it, it's, it can only be you that looks at that image. You know, if there's a group of people, it's, it's a singular thing that personal relationship absolutely with whereas you know big image then you know, maybe get three or four people standing behind and looking at it it's uh, very much a personal thing so that, that that's why i like printing that particular size i can print bigger but and also the cost of platinum you know if, if it's twice the size it's four times the volume yeah. and all that sort of yeah. thing so uh, and more opportunity for mistakes when yes. you get bigger, i presume yes yeah. all those things now this you're saying this is quite close to your house as well yes it, well if you photograph near home it gives you more opportunities, and I think there's also that connect with the landscape. I mean, just from practical points of view, you know when the crops are coming in or particular leaves are coming out. But also there's something special about home, um, something special about the place that you live, you bring your children up. That, that connection is something that you don't get uh, if you go to Iceland. Yes. And uh, have a nice holiday. It's difficult to create a body of work like this from a few holidays in Iceland. Yeah. It's five years to do, to do these images and about five months of printing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So a bit of a commitment, but you know, a very enjoyable and um, again a great way. That this this particular picture is is something that everybody's wanted past the week feels like this. Yeah, but it's a great example of how the lens can, the lenses you use and the process and the way you take pictures simplify things. That's right. And because this is still it's it's a complex view, a field of wheat. Um, and you could use a macro lens and just concentrate on one particular ear. But really, you, you, want, you still want to be that feeling that you're in the wheat. And um, It's like guiding the eye around the picture, because yeah. those central, it's the central hotspot of the lens. Almost, it it is. It brings your eye in. So these, these old lenses do tend to encourage a central composition rather than your rule of thirds composition, that's for sure. Um, but they do, they do, I mean, I think particularly the, the, these images work well in monochrome, in black and white, because they all are about light and shade and texture and tone. Now, you, now you say you print 10 by 8, but you shoot 4 by 5 yeah. negs. How, how do you go about printing? Well, in the old days, you'd enlarge it through various stages on film. They don't make that film anymore, so these are scanned images and then printed onto clear uh, you know, inkjets onto onto a clear material yeah. and then contact printed. So, and that that process isn't it's quite peculiar because you've shown me some of the the negatives um, look strange. The negatives the, you've got some that are colour, strange blue colours, some that are strange or amber colours, and some that almost look black and white. And That's right. But they don't look like proper inverted pictures. I think yes, and that's because you're shining an ultraviolet light through it, and the the the, the, the ferric oxalate get too technical but the ferric oxalate that you use with the plasma and palladium is sensitive to ultraviolet light at just that particular wavelength um, and the inks um, block ultraviolet at, at um, different wavelengths yeah. and they block normal light so when so you look at the negative it can all look a bit strange so a dark ink might be more transparent to ultraviolet than a, yeah. a light ink and uh, different colors have different effects as well um, um, but, so you, but you're you print these currently on a Epson three eight eighty. Yes. Um, yeah. And then, did you make your own contact print for a UV? Yes. Uh, well, you can't really buy these at the shops. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I had to. Make, I've made a a, um, a UV um, a sort of light box. I mean, you can you can use the sun, um, but obviously you can't print at night, and you can only print on a couple of days of the year where I live. Yeah. Um, so um, it's a UV uh, lighting system, which is basically it's the insecticuta lights they use in the back of you know delicatessen okay, and places yeah, like that. Yeah. So they attract that UV light attracts uh, 
bugs and things. Do so they I, do that in your dark room as well? In this, in this. <laughs> Thankfully, there are too many bugs in my dark room, <laughs> but yes, it would do. <laughs> so uh, I use that, and then, I, and then I made my own contact printing frame as well, obviously, because you need to get the negative and the paper absolutely tight together as you can. Yeah, so they don't blur. That's right. Yeah. Um, but you're moving to try um, assist. And this now we should mention there is a, a there is a or was a very very talented man called David Chow. Who was yes. One of the experts in platinum palladium in the UK who sadly died at the end of last year. That's right, yes. Um, and he, you went on one of his courses. Yeah, I knew David and um, I went. I, I spent quite a bit of time with him, sort of honing skills and to asking questions and we went to a few exhibitions and things together and uh, he'll be sadly missed, yes. But he, rec he recommended the cone inks. I, I, well, the, the hardest part in this process is, is, is probably the digital negative. You know, actually slapping some palladium, platinum onto paper, letting it dry and exposing it to a negative isn't too hard. Um, the, you know, the concentrations that you can change and the contrast differences that you can make and the humidity changes all will have an influence on the image. But certainly I think that the key is the digital negative and it's the hardest thing to get right. And, and you often have to print using a completely different technique based on the tones that you really want to preserve in the image. Um, so I think each platinum printer probably has three or four different ways of making a digital negative, yeah. depending on the particular image they're printing. So there's always a, you know, a workaround. But I'm going to try um, John Cohn's pigment prints, and which is using um, carbon. And these are just different dilutions of carbon That's for right. all the different eight inks. So you yeah, can, so you can pick much more similar to a, a, a silver negative. Hopefully smoother tonality across yes. the whole range. Yeah. We'll see how they, those work out later. Now this is one of the ones that I loved from the from the top room yeah. of the exhibition. I think it looks better as a print rather than on the on the screen. It's actually. difficult it's difficult to translate yeah. platinum plane because it's this uh, it seems so much about the blacks. It does. In you know it's about everything but there, there is so there is delicate. a density and a transition in the blacks that is that has to be seen in a print I think. And yeah. I, the only time I've seen similar things is uh, on a John Blakemore workshop. Mm -hmm. You're a fan of John Blakemore? He's my nemesis. <laughs> you were saying this, yes. <laughs> Every time I take an image and I think, oh, that's good. I really like that. No one's done that before. I open my John Blakemore book and there it is. <laughs> he, he was a, yes. He's a master, isn't he? Yes. And he, he, he had this ex excellent uh, way of producing prints that were all about the darks or all about the lights and yes. high key and low key and and that's what has to be seen I think here if you can, if you can get an opportunity to see the exhibitions go to the Victorian Albert or um, give David a ring and say can I pop round yes or well, the um, Museum of Photography up in Bradford has got a really good uh, good good selection as well oh, can you go and you can make a book book in to go to see the archive I think yes. as well there it's because uh, yeah. it's an open they did museum. an exhibition at the Science Museum uh, just before Christmas, and I think that's one of the best exhibitions I've ever been to. It was, uh, you know, from the first photo, you know, images ever made. Yes, that's more it's time. running. It is actually running at the Bradford well, Photography Museum. That's well um, worth the trip. That is, that was fantastic. This is some uh, hornbeam, hornbeam keys, taken last spring. This, this is taken on a pet swell lens. And it's that curved sort of plane of focus. We, we, so you can actually alter where you want the sharpness um, in the image. So not just in the centre. You can, you know, depending on where you put things. And you use you use camera movements as well as um, these lenses on some lenses. I and mean, the Petzval doesn't have much coverage, so it doesn't give no, you a lot the, of opportunity. That's right. The, Pet, the Petzval is not so good with movement because it just it's not really designed for, for it to cover five four. So it always, you know, you can see this image is vignetting quite a bit, which is just a natural effect of the lens. And the interesting thing about the Pets Falls is they were never meant to cover 5.4, were they? They were, Not this particular they were only one, no. meant to cover medium format or even smaller. That's right. So what, you know, you'd have like a, almost like a credit card size image from, a, from, a, from this particular lens that you'd you know, keep in your wallet of your loved yeah. one or whatever. So they just use the centre of the uh, image circle. And you say you dismantled your lens and found out where it was from. Yes. Uh, yeah, because uh, it, it was like a no-name, don't know what this is on, on eBay. And... Uh, <laughs> Which is where I get most of my camera equipment, of course. And um, yes, I, I took it apart. And um, back in the day, they'd sign the lens, and it was signed by Jamin, who was a optician 
who uh, made uh, you know all sorts yeah, not all sorts of lenses you know uh, camera lenses as well yeah. as optical lenses for you know, spectacles back in 1849 it was Paris and you're saying he he trained Dalla that's right yeah, yeah. so. Um, and the dollar Petzl was one of the one of the famous ones. That was That's the name, name of Petzl. Yeah. That's it. And you had the guy that taught him. Yes. <laughs> it's another We walked past this actually today. Is this the brook? Yeah. Where just... um near the dam? Um no, this was um near the Ministry of Defence. Where you said it looked like Bloch two yes. or whatever. Yes. This is only about sort of seven or eight inches across actually. And it's taken with this ice lens, and it's uh, it's a sort of lovely. Sound. I mean, where it's where it's sharp, it's it's nice and crisp, but it, mm. it does fade in and out of focus beautifully. Yeah, um, just the light was just lovely on that particular gill. And did I mean, did you know what this lens was when you were buying it for off eBay, <laughs> or did you did you know what it was going to do, or was it a lucky find? I think it was a lucky find. Yes, it's certainly taken me in a new direction with my photography. It's expanded sort of how I think of the world a bit really definitely and this is the, the last photograph of this series yeah this is a new project I've got on for this year um, I knew that photographically I, I did a huge amount last year and <laughs> quite a time commitment to print all these platinum images and I knew that I didn't want to spend so much time away doing photography. I had other commitments this year and the family's growing up and I really wanted to spend some time with them so I really wanted to concentrate on something that I could get to you know just for the odd minute here and there. So this is a pond that's it's only half a mile away from my house and um, I found that quite a liberating experience really just to concentrate on one subject that's so near and that has such a connection with and just see how much it changes day by day. It's quite incredible. Something that you just walk past and wouldn't take any notice of. Yeah. Um, and this is an image I made with the wolf moon. You know those big moons okay. that you get. Yeah. Was that the super moon? Yeah. Was this, was, this was damn cold. This is a January night, <laughs> and uh, it's about eleven at night, and the moon was just rising. And uh, there I was, stood up to my knees in this pond, thinking, "I wonder what I'm doing here, really." And I hope no now, one notices. <laughs> now you said you had a secret technique to make the uh, the moon extend in the reflection. Well, it's it's about a fifteen to twenty second exposure. And what I noticed was, as I was sort of moving around to keep myself warm, <laughs> that the ripples that were coming out from my wellies, as they went across, you know, when I, when I was first there and the, the water was still, there were, there were two moons. Obviously, there's a moon in the sky and then there was the moon in the, in the water. And then as I moved, these ripples just sort of went out. And uh, I thought, well, with a long exposure, that's going to sort of stretch everything. And so I gave it a go and... So it stamped up and down for the full exposure. I did. <laughs> Hoping no one was watching. Me. A little happy dance. Yes. Oh, thank you very much for that. We're going to show a few few um, photographs on the website of, of the work here and of the exhibition. Yeah. A little gallery on there. And do you have any plans to exhibit any more work in the future? And the, but this exhibition was my fourteenth exhibition. And in, in about five years, so I'm a little bit exhibitioned out. But if anyone's out there and wants to show some of my images, that'd be great. Yeah. Um, but for now, I think I'm going to concentrate on this project and I'm going to concentrate just on getting that perfect platinum print. I'm, I'm getting close to what I would, I would like to get to, but it, there's still some way to go. So I think some time in the dark room and then some time concentrating on this project is what I've got in mind for the next year. Maybe perhaps we can talk into writing a little bit about these Koenigs yeah. you know, when you've got your head around them. Yeah, they haven't arrived yet, but when they've arrived, then I'll certainly load them up and we'll see what we've got. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tim.